You shouldn't buy a computer based on other people's needs. If you're looking for a Mac and want what could be the best value in terms of performance and features, you need to check out the M1 Mac Mini. It starts at $699, has a small footprint and the extremely capable M1 chip. And at the same time, there are some limitations that would impact a small segment of users. So let's talk about the pros and the cons, talk about who this device is for, and see if it's a good fit for your needs and what configuration you should get. First thing that stood out to me when I got the M1 Mac Mini is just how small it is. I know that in our house, we've had to convert multiple spaces into work or study stations. And we don't always have a ton of room to work with. Now, being able to have a full desktop setup without needing a a large tower is an outstanding solution. You can still use a full-size keyboard, a mouse, and a large monitor without worrying about floor or desk space for a tower. With a four foot desk, which I think is like 122 centimeters, something like that, there's a ton of space left over, even after adding some of the accessories that I'm gonna mention later. And if you want even more space, I'll link to some vertical mounts in the description. Now next I wanna talk about the available ports. So looking at the back of the Mac mini, we have a power button, the power cord input, a gigabit ethernet port, two Thunderbolt slash USB four ports, an HDMI 2.0 port, two USB-A ports, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Now, some people criticize the M1 Mac Mini for not having enough ports because the 2018 version had four Thunderbolt 3 ports. This is where you need to look at your specific use case and decide whether your needs are the same as theirs. In my first setup, I have a single monitor connected with an HDMI cable, a wireless keyboard, and a wireless mouse. So I still have all four ports open. If I use a wired mouse and a wired keyboard, that would still leave two ports open, so I can still add two additional accessories, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, of course, I can think of a setup with two monitors taking up the two Thunderbolt ports, then a USB keyboard and a USB mouse, and then you're all out of ports, unless you use a hub. Now, personally, I didn't actually add a hub because I needed additional ports. I added one because I wanted a card reader and then I figured I might as well get some additional ports and move them closer to me. So the first hub I used was a USB-C hub that I ran around the edge of my desk with an extension USB-C cable. And this worked well and it gave me additional ports where I could plug my portable SSD to without having to reach to the back of the Mac mini. Then I switched to a Satoshi Type-C aluminum stand and hub, which fits right under the Mac mini and gives me an SD and micro SD card reader, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, three USB 3.0 ports, and a USB-C data port. Now, this is a super clean solution. There's no need to run wires and it plugs right into the back of the Mac mini. I use two different SSDs with my Mac mini and I'll explain why in a minute, but I have one permanently plugged into the back of the Mac mini and I have the other one plugged into the front via the hub. So you might be wondering why I have an external SSD to begin with and you might be even more curious about why I use two of them. It all has to do with the configuration and pricing of the M1 Mac mini. A criticism of this device has to do with the fact that you can't upgrade the internal storage or the RAM. So if you choose to go with a 256 gig SSD and eight gigs of RAM like I did, that's all you'll ever have. Now some users point out that paying 200 bucks for eight gigabytes of additional RAM for a total of 16 gigs is way too high. And that 16 gigabytes isn't enough for them. The cost is what it is. I mean, it's an Apple device. If you wanna upgrade the unified RAM, it's gonna be 200 bucks and it's the only chance you'll ever have to do that. Now, as far as needing 16 gigs of RAM or even more, you need to decide if that's a real requirement for you. I didn't buy this machine to replace an iMac or a Mac Pro. While the M1 chip is an absolute monster in terms of performance, and this cheapest version of the Mac mini has absolutely crushed anything I threw at it, including editing video on the non-optimized for silicon Adobe Premiere Pro, this is not designed as a pro machine and I don't critique it as one. So for example, when I look at the M1 MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro, and I see that both of them only have two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports. I'm more critical of the Pro because by its very nature, it's designed for a more demanding user who's likely to want more ports. The MacBook Air is designed for an entry level user, which I think is less likely to need additional ports. So I'll say it again, this machine was not designed as a Pro machine. It's the cheapest Mac that Apple makes, and yet, 
for the majority of users and the large majority at that, the M1 chip and the unified RAM will provide more power than they need for the next five to seven years. If you want to upgrade and have to choose between RAM and internal storage, consider upgrading the RAM. You won't have an opportunity to do that in the future, and you can always add external storage like I did. Now, if you're still with me and have gotten value from this video, give it a thumbs up. It lets me know what kind of content you like so that I can make more of it. And I still see that over 90% of you are new viewers, so hit that subscribe button. Now going back to why I have two SSDs, the first one stays put and is pretty much always connected to the Mac Mini. The second one is shared between my Mac Mini, my MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, my iPads, and then even my main Windows workstation. And that's the one that I plug into the front for easier access. And the one I'm currently using on the back is the OWC Envoy Pro EX one terabyte. It's a bus powered Thunderbolt 3 SSD with blazing speeds of up to 28 megabytes per second. Now, this thing is crazy good. And while you might gawk at the $300 price, it's still one full terabyte, which costs $100 less than the Apple upgrade from 256 to one terabyte. So you're paying 25% less and you're getting 33% more. And I have no problems editing 4K footage right off of that drive. And in fact, if I travel and need to edit video on the go, this drive is extremely rugged, so I can bring it with me with no problems. When I want something smaller and more portable, I use the CalDigit Tough Nano. This drive is rugged, it's tiny, it gives me speeds at up to 1,055 megabytes per second, and it could be fully submerged in one meter or three feet of water for up to 30 seconds. No, that's not something that I plan on testing if I can help it, but it's good to know. And the next reason why I think the cheapest M1 Mac Mini is a great option for a large majority of users is the Apple ecosystem. If you already have an iPhone or an iPad and you're ready to add a computer, the Mini is the least expensive Mac that will give you that functionality. I have an entire video dedicated to the Apple ecosystem, why I enjoy using it, and what I now miss when I go back to my Windows machine. So if you're interested, I'll link to that video at the end. Now next, I wanna talk about some of the limitations of the M1 Mac Mini. Now I mentioned a few of them already, but I wanna consolidate them into one section. Again, it's not upgradable in terms of RAM or internal storage. For many users, this is not an issue since they don't upgrade their systems even when that's an option. For those who see this as a critical need, the M1 Mac Mini is not a good fit. Next, unless you jump through some hoops, the M1 Mac Mini is limited to two external displays. The majority of users only use one display. And if you go up to two displays, that covers the overwhelming majority of users. If you absolutely need more than that, then again, the M1 Mac Mini might not be the right choice. If you've watched my channel, you know that my main workstation has seven monitors connected, but that's a system that I had built specifically for that need, and it's not something that I expect from an entry-level $700 computer. Now moving on, if your primary use of your computer is gaming, the Mac Mini probably wouldn't be my first choice. As far as that goes, I'm not sure any Mac would be my first choice, so I don't know if that's a worthwhile distinction. And the next limitation, at least at this time, is that there isn't a fully stable version of Parallels. So if that's a requirement, you may wanna wait a little longer. And I don't wanna sound like a broken record here, but again, this is important to a limited and very specific subset of users. Now, the last two limitations that I wanna discuss affect an even smaller segment, but I'll still mention them. First, there is no external GPU support on the Mac Mini. And second, there is no option for a 10 gigabit ethernet port. I don't associate either of those with an entry level machine, so I don't really see how it's a significant concern, but it is something that I've heard a small group of users talk about, so I'm including it. And when I look at the target audience for the M1 Mac Mini, I definitely think that getting the cheapest version with 256 gigs of internal storage and eight gigs of RAM is the right choice for most users. If you want more internal storage, jump to 512 and then supplement with less expensive external storage. If you feel like you have higher RAM needs now or you'll need more in the future, go ahead and upgrade to 16 gigs of RAM. I can't imagine you regretting that. I wanna mention again that I was editing videos, using Chrome, using Lightroom, and I've had no issues with eight gigabytes of RAM. Now remember that I have links in the description to all the products that I talk about. Hopefully this video was helpful. Click on my face to subscribe and then watch one of these videos. You know what I always say? Buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck.
and see you soon.